Welcome to the League of Women Voters Candidates Forum for the Poudre School District Board of Education. My name, is, my name is Karen Wagner. I'm a member of the League and will moderate the first half of tonight's forum. The League wishes to upfront acknowledge the Poudre School District for making tonight's forum possible and for providing the assistance of Channel 10 in filming the forum. The forum will be rebroadcast several times on the City of Fort Collins cable channel 14 between now and Election Day, November 1st. I'd like to interject a special thank you to the League's voter service team for organizing the forum and assisting tonight. As both voters and viewers may be aware, the Board of Education is comprised of seven members who are elected for four-year unpaid terms. This year, there are four positions up for re-election, and those will be filled in the November 1st election. Members of the board are elected at large, meaning that voters have an opportunity to vote in each of the district races. This election is an all mail-in ballot election. Ballots will be mailed to voters on or around October 11th. At this time, I would like to introduce the candidates. And tonight, we're going to go left to right all night. Hope that doesn't put you to sleep. But on the far left is Kathy Kipp. And to her left is Barbara Shireen. And they are the candidates for District 8. Next to Barbara is Tom Balshak, close enough, who is uncontested in District B. Next to Tom is Nancy Telez, and to her left, Stephen Urash. They are running in District F. And the final district is District G. Candidates are Teresa Affleck, Affleck and Teresa Gutowski. We've got some good names here tonight, and some good candidates, but the names are good too. Now for the forum ground rules. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves and explain why, are they, why they are running for the Board of Education. After the introductions, candidates will each have a minute and a half to respond to questions submitted by the audience and screen to avoid duplication. We will start the round of questions with a few questions submitted by the League of Women Voters. Timekeepers are seated in the front row, and they will signal the candidates when they have 30 minutes, excuse me, 30 seconds, <laughs> I knew I'd do that, 30 seconds remaining, and then they will also signal them a final time when their time has expired. Please don't take 30 minutes. <laughs> and the ground rules for the audience are simple. Please refrain from expressing your opinion in any manner and that includes applause. Doing so takes time away from the candidates. We will start now with introductions, or the candidate introductions, which they have prepared, and as a reminder, you have two minutes. So we'll start with Kathy Kipp. Hi, I'm Kathy Kipp, and um, I am a parent in Poudre School District, and first of all, I would like to start by thanking the um, League of Women Voters for putting on this forum. Um, we appreciate that you continue to do this educational service for the community on an ongoing basis, so thank you for doing that. Um, as I said, I'm a parent. I have two kids in Bolts Middle School. Um, they're in the eighth grade. They're a little bit older now, so now I have time to do even more volunteer work, but actually, um, uh, just as an informational point, I'm the only parent um, of current PSD kids who is running for school board this time around. So I really think, really think it's important to have that voice heard in the school district. Um, I jumped in and started volunteering when my kids, who are twins, entered uh, kindergarten eight years ago, and I've been volunteering ever since. Um, I've served 
on a variety of positions in the schools. I've done everything from classroom volunteer to managing book fairs to uh, PTO president, all that kind of stuff. Um, I've also served on a variety of positions in the school district. Um, I've been on the calendar committee. I've been on the district advisory board. I've been the chair, the secretary, the membership person, and a whole variety of different committees on um, in the district advisory board. The district advisory board, by the way, is our parent and community group that advises the district. And I've been doing that for the past seven years. Um, I've also served on the student-based budgeting committee, um, the small schools committee, the feasibility committee a couple years, just a wide variety of committees. So I feel I have a broad amount of experience to bring to the school board. I do a very good job, I believe, in asking questions and thinking and uh, giving, hopefully, a good, good feedback in terms of listening to the, the parents and community and bringing those thoughts back to the groups that I serve on. Um, I'm working to have an open and transparent school district, and those are really my primary um, reasons for running. Thanks so much. Thank you. Barbara? I'm Barbara Shireen. Excuse me. I'm Barbara Shireen, and I am uh, presently serving on the Board of Education. I've been on the board for four years. The last two years I have served as the vice president. I am running again because of my experience on the board. I have an in-depth knowledge of the district and the community and the education goals that we're trying to achieve. I've served on the audit committee, the curriculum committee at our my kids' schools, um, the district advisory committee, and uh, the district advisory board legislative committee, among many other committees. I've been a member of the foundation school district foundation board for six years and Project SMILE and uh, numerous other committees. Um, I decided to run again because we have some really challenging times ahead of us. And with my experience, I'll be able to hit the ground running. There won't be any learning curve time. Um, in November, last November, most of you know that we had the Katy report. And from that, we learned a lot of good information about the district. And as a result of that, um, the board is working on a strategic plan and a strategic vision for the district to guide the de decisions in the future, um, seeking you know, the North Star for the district and a way to uh, evaluate how we're progressing. I'm well re a well-reasoned person. I seek data when I'm making decisions. I seek community input, and I'm very able to make tough decisions on controversial issues. I think strategically and I act decisively um, after considering all the voices and all the data, then I go ahead and make an informed decision best for the whole. So I would like to ask for your support and thank you for inviting us here tonight. Thank you. Tom? I'd also like to thank uh, the League of Women Voters uh, for continuing to provide this public service. I'm running for a re-election because I care about education as an investment in the future. I want to contribute back to the community in an area where I have expertise and passion. I believe in the quality of employees in the district and support the mission and vision of the district. I favor and will continue to advocate for a balanced curriculum offerings, which include the arts and PE as basic academic subjects. I'm excited about the possibility of intergovernmental cooperation around the community schools concept and will work to make this a reality. I'm interested in working with teachers, principals, and staff in the community around the implementation of uh, Senate Bill 191, Educator Effectiveness as Required by State Law. I believe in collaborative processes to solve problems. My skills and experience include 37 years of uh, professional experience related to education as a teacher, coach, curriculum coordinator, PSD school board member, and Colorado Association of School Boards Board of Directors member representing Northern Colorado. I've taught multiple subjects in both private and public schools, which includes teaching at the university level, the high school level, and the junior high level. I've been involved in the education reform movement at the local, state, and national level since the mid-1980s. For example, this year, as part of uh, CASB's Federal Relations Network, I've met with congressional and Senate staff um, from about uh, six seats um, in talking about the reauthorization of the No Child Left Behind legislation and unfunded mandates. Earlier today, I journeyed with Superintendent Wilsons to Denver and testified before the State Board on the implementation of Senate Bill 191. 
I've been a writer and field editor for a national education magazine and research diligently and thoroughly issues which come before the board. My committee work with the PSD board includes serving as board rep to the Faith Volunteer Program and as a liaison to the district advisory board. Thank you. Nancy? Hi, I'm Nancy Telez. Um, I'd also like to thank the League for creating this opportunity for citizens to hear from the candidates who will be making decisions about your public schools. I'm a 40-year resident of Fort Collins, the mother of two grown kids who went through PSD and are now productive, successful adults. I'm active in the community in a variety of organizations, and I'm a retired teacher, uh, having taught in uh, Poudre School District and, and then for a short time at CSU. I've served on the PSD school board since 2005, and I've served as the board president for the last two years. In my time on the board, I have learned a great deal about how a school district operates and the complexity of district operations and issues. I'm running for the school board because I believe an effective school system is the key to the success of a community and its children. I believe the board's focus should be developing and supporting implementation of goals that lead a successful district to even more effectively educating students. Some of my priorities for the district are meeting the diverse learning needs of all students, closing the achievement gap while providing rich, broad-based educational experiences for students at all levels of achievement, providing support and training for educators for the variety of tasks that they perform, and providing technology-rich learning opportunities for all students and the relevant professional development for teachers in order to make that effective. I feel that the experiences that I have had uh, and the work that I have done prepare me very effectively uh, to continue my work on the board. Thank you. Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the Candidates Forum. I'm Steve Urash, candidate district F. Um, I've lived in Fort Collins for about eight years, since 2003. Before that, I lived in Palo Alto, California, which is where Before that, thank you. Um, so uh, I grew up in Palo Alto, California, the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, which is where I grew up. I have a BS degree in physics from San Jose State. And I've worked at seven different Silicon Valley companies uh, before I started working at Intel in 1997 in Santa Clara. And then uh, I still work for Intel uh, here in Fort Collins doing design tests and debug engineering. I'm currently on the city's electric board and the Larimer County Board of Health uh, because I think it's important how government uh, performs and is efficient and effective in its tasks. And I care about people and uh, how we take care of those who are less fortunate in our community. I've had three children in the district that have all graduated from high school here. Um, uh, Brett has graduated from Ridgeview and the other two from Fort Collins High School and my daughter Melissa spent a year in the IB program. So I have experience in several different programs that uh, are in the district. Uh, I'm a candidate because uh, the, of the many community members that I've talked to, Many believe that our, our school board could do better. Uh, there's been disappointment in the community over some of the decisions that have been taken, including uh, whether or not to close Lopez or Beatty Elementary Schools and the um, uh, attendance areas surrounding Zach. Uh, I believe that there are very important issues coming up, including the teacher evaluations, and I wanna be that voice on the board representing parents and taxpayers in those negotiations because I believe I have the business experience and the real world experience to handle uh, evaluations which will be changing due to that recent law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Teresa? Good evening. My name is Teresa Affleck and I just wanted to um, thank the, the League of Women Voters for inviting me here tonight and commend them for the deep research that they do to find best practices um, in education. So thank you for that. Um, like I said, my name is Teresa Affleck and I'm running for the Board of Education be because I believe I can bring a fresh perspective to the board. <clears throat> I come with no affiliations with any special interest groups. And because of that, I believe I can bring objective thinking grounded in data, I'm a researcher at heart, um, uh, to all of my decisions for our students. Um, 
to accomplish this, I believe the board, uh, the board needs to do a better job with your communi open communication um, with taxpayers, with parents, um, and also with the community at large. <clears throat> um, I will also advocate for the continued development and uh, effective implementation of uh, the communication slash interaction with the community plan, which is something the board is working on, and to achieve a two-way uh, two exchange of ideas. I, I think that's important. Um, in today's economy, the board also needs to take fiscal responsibility and accountability um, to taxpayers more seriously. Um, I support uh, district decision making uh, that considers best use of tax dollars um, for long-term educational value. Um, additionally, I will work to create reporting that is easily accessible and understandable to all. Um, and since I have a little bit of time, I'm going to talk about my background. I've lived in Fort Collins for 10 years, been married to my husband for nine, and he's in the audience. Um, and we're adopting a little girl from Kyrgyzstan, and she's three and a half, and we've been in process for three and a half years. Um, I'll talk more about my background at the end, at the conclusion. So thank you, and I'd love your support. Thanks. Thank you. Susan. Again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, too, for making the forum possible so that we can share our ideas with you. Um, I, my name is Susan Gutowski. It's kind of coincidental that I'm running for um, District G as well, Gutowski and G. I thought, you know, <laughs> kind of crazy. But anyway, it happened. Um, and um, I've lived in Fort Collins for 32 years. Uh, I grew up in California, though, and, and uh, went to the University of California, Irvine. Had a wonderful year abroad uh, at the University of Madrid, Spain. Uh, it was fun for me because I come from a Hispanic family and we hail from Spain. And I just thought, you know, how fun to go there and practice my language and, uh, and just enjoy the culture. Uh, that was the junior year. Came back um, when we moved to Fort Collins. Then I took advantage of wonderful CSU and got my master's in education and became an ardent, feverish Ram fan. And we're season ticket holders and all that kind of stuff too. So if there's any Ram fans in the, uh, in the audience, you know, bleed green and gold. Um, the other thing, though, is that uh, uh, we raised our family here in Fort Collins, and they went to PSD schools. Our son is a Secret Service agent uh, living in Washington, D.C. now, and our daughter is a fifth grade teacher in uh, Loveland. Both of our kids have, um, have said that they owe it to PSD and the quality education that they received. Um, for their success. And I think it's time, I'm retired, I have the time, it's a huge volunteer job, the board, it takes a lot of time. And I'm ready at this point because I'm, I'm retired and I think actually it's time for me to give back um, to the community that was so good to me and was so good to our kids. Thank you. Now we will start with the questions and we will start, in this case, with Barbara and move left to right until everyone's had an opportunity to answer. And I guess that means you'd like to know the question. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what will be your approach to resolving disputes among members of the board? So this has to do with your personal style. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a very good listener and listen to people's points of view and honor what they say and respect what they say and then uh, share my point of view and you know try to find common ground I have a very calm demeanor and I work well with lots of different personality types um, it's important as a board member we're all just one person and you can express your your position respectfully, but after the board has voted, it's important we all come together behind that vote because we act as one as a board. So it's, it's, there's a fine balance there between expressing your own point of view, but being reasonable and cooperative to get something done to get the work finished, and then come together after the vote's been taken and then the whole board needs to get behind. Thank, Thank you. you. Tom, same question. Yes, um, 
I've been um, uh, trained in, in terms of resolving conflicts on a consensus-based process um, that was used by a gentleman by the name of, of Bob Chadwick who uh, came to the district and, and uh, shared his ability to um, have people tell their stories to come to consensus in, in order to resolve problems. Um, not that you have to agree on anything, um, but you have to have a legitimate process which respects divergent points of view, um, come to an area where you can make agreement and essentially um, try and make decisions um, based upon a type of consensus. However, there are some times when you cannot reach consensus and that's why elected boards take votes. And um, I totally agree with Barbara that um, the only way that the board speaks is when um, it speaks through a vote. And uh, while we sometimes are on different sides of the vote, it's important to um, respect that decision and not try to undermine it um, and uh, to move on as best we can once a decision has been made. I think um, being respectful of different opinions is uh, crucial. I think also getting to know board members um, as individuals is important. Um, we may have differences of opinions, but we're human beings who share similar interest and uh, a common cause of trying to make this the best district that we can. Thank you. Nancy? I think it's important uh, when, a, when a board begins its work, and, and this will happen soon after the election, that together we establish a clear understanding among all board members of how we're going to operate. And that requires taking some time to have conversations about that so that we come to agreement before we ever come to any of those issues uh, that this is how this is how we're going to operate these are the basic principles we're going to observe and this is why we think they're important and then following that uh, we do some training um, on the board of sound and effective board practices so that everyone has a kind of an equal understanding of, of where we're operating. Certainly having uh, conversations uh, that are open and uh, respectful is another important element in resolving uh, issues that do come up. And I quite agree with what's been said before that uh, it is important that we understand that while we have differences of opinion, that doesn't mean that we are against each other. We are all a member, members of a board that have a very important task in the district, and we need to remember that that is the main goal. Thank you. Stephen. Thanks. I have experience on the city's electric board and the Larimer County Board of Health in operating in an environment like a board uh, where the communication styles among members is very important. I had an impact on both of those boards. Uh, I, my input was uh, essential in changing the way the electric board writes its minutes and communicates the essential items to the city council. And on the Board of Health, I had an impact in that um, it was my request to have the budget variances, so the variance between the budget and the actual expenditures shown on the budget sheets. And that uh, recommendation will, uh, has also been uh, taken up by Larimer County as well, not just the Board of Health. So the way we proceed and the process that a, a board operates under is very important. And I take that seriously. And I think we can all look to examples of like Kelly Olson and Jerry Horak on the city council as good examples of how process is important. And it's not just the process between the board members, but it's also the process between the board and the citizens that is absolutely essential in getting our work done right. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa. Um, I really like something that Stephen R. Covey said, and that is, <clears throat> if you want to be understood, you need, need to first try to understand the other person. So I think the basis would be respect um, for the other board members. Um, on a personal note, I have six brothers and sisters. There will be six other board members. For me, it's not a big jump, OK? <laughs> and I, I am the middle child. There's three older and three younger. And the middle ch ch children usually happen to be the peacemakers. So um, it's not going to be a big jump for me, I'm going to tell you. So, other things that I, I bring to the table is um, I've had 17 years of uh, being an educator um, in different ways, pre-K through higher education. Um, 
And you really have to learn how to work with people in that instance. Um, parents, um, the, the children that you work with, students, um, and try and see it from their point of view, even if it's not the same point of view that you have. Um, uh, I, I always like to recommend books, and I think one of the books I recommend is called Crucial Confrontations, How to Talk with Other People in a, an Effective Way. But also, you know, have your point of view um, heard too. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? This is where 26 years in the classroom with middle school students comes in. Um, I have uh, 34 years of experience, but um, 26 of them were here in PSD with middle school kids. And often we worked on interpersonal skills. And it's necessary at that level. And kids are not always kind to one another. So the interpersonal skills that we worked with are being polite, um, uh, being a team, um, all the skills that are important if you're going to work on a board, actually any kind of team, but on the board it's, it's, it's crucial. And, um, and consensus building. And one of the things that I told my kids, and I think it applies as a board member as well, and it was mentioned earlier, is that you may get your way some of the time. You won't always get your way. But when you don't get your way, you have to agree to disagree. And you have to agree to work with the decision that was made. And then who knows? Down the road, you might get your way, and, and others will accord you the same courtesy. But I think that those skills apply to working on the board. We have lots of work to do. We have task forces to administer. We have all sorts of different things. And we definitely need to set common goals. And we definitely need to, to work as a team. Thank you. Kathy. Well, I think a lot of good things have been said here. We obviously need to have respect for each other. We need to have teamwork. Um, but there's other things as well. I think you need to bring in optimism. I think you need to bring in humor. I think you need to bring in um, a willingness to work with other people. And I don't like the word confrontation, so that, that book has me a little bit on edge just because I don't think that's how you get your best results from people. You need to approach people with, you know what, this is a problem. Let's talk about it. Let's ask questions. Let's listen to our community and try and find solutions. I think that there are so many places we can go that don't involve confrontations. I think, you know, as a parent, for instance, if you're in a school, perhaps you want to go and talk to your teacher because you're mad about something. If you go up to your teacher and say, why on earth did you do this to my child? And say, you know, can you tell me, as opposed to walking up and saying, you know, can you tell me what's going on in the classroom because I don't really understand it? And it really, a, a big part of it is your whole personal style, as you said this question relates to, and a personal approach. And I think that if you have a positive personal approach to working with other people, you can accomplish a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question um, starts with a lengthy statement con that references a couple of pages in the Poudre School District budget. I'm not going to read that part. I'm going to read you the gist of the question, mm -hmm. which is, Please explain what your plans are to get overhead spending under control. Tom, we'll start this round with you. Well, I wish the question was a little bit more specific because it's easier to address um, where we would look to solve those problems um, if I knew uh, what specifics that uh, they were identifying. Um, so is there any more there that? <laughs> <laughs> OK. We'll start over again. Okay. And I hope I read this to you correctly. And this is possibly part opinion, but mm -hmm. also possibly part quoted from the budget. Total appropriation is $450 million for 25,000 students, or 18 k per student. And that's citing page one of the budget. Then they cite page 17 says that $7,684 are allocated per student. And then the questioner indicates that that's 10,000 per student overhead. And that's why I tried to make it brief. Hmm. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've learned by being on the board is not to venture into areas that 
um, I need more information about. And uh, so I apologize for not um, answering uh, that particular question. And um, um, I, I, that's, that's the best I can do on that without more specifics. Okay. Nancy? No, I don't, I don't know what that is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, first of all, I don't know where those numbers came from, but I do have right in front of me the uh, amount, um, the PSD average amount per pupil, which does not coincide with the number that was given there. So, uh, you know, numbers are always a dangerous territory. I think you really have to check and uh, to know exactly where you are with those. Uh, but regardless of the specific numbers, one thing to know is that our budget is always balanced. We, we cannot spend more money than we have. So we do that every year. Uh, in order to do that, in recent years, we have had to prioritize where we were going to make cuts and where we were not going to make cuts because that's been the mode of budgeting. We have done that uh, by, as a board, uh, by talking with people in the community. We've had uh, community input related to what the community values. And we have then uh, given to our, uh, our uh, budget uh, department our priorities, and they have, uh, by following those, developed a budget. We are extremely fortunate to have had our community pass the mill and bond. And that means that we're not in nearly as terrible a shape as some other districts in Colorado are. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Sure. Overhead refers to those expenditures that are not directly involved in the cost of goods sold, right? So our cost of goods sold is what happens in the classroom. Right, because our product is a student that graduates high school. So the, our overhead expenditures would be outside the classroom, transportation for our busing, uh, food services perhaps, although some of that's mandated, uh, the administration costs that we have here in this building and under Dr. Wilson. So the question really is, uh, are those administrative expenses effective in supporting the activities that occur in the classroom? We do spend quite a bit outside the classroom. Um, I'm not prepared to say whether that's perfectly in line with what we should be doing or not, but because it is more than what other districts do, it's probably a place that we'll have to cut uh, because of any future budget issues. So, um, and that's one of the reasons why the decision came before the board to close Beatty, right? We, uh, the, administration identified that as a critical place that where we could save money by optimizing the student seats in our buildings and the board shot that down so luckily we have the mill levy increase to counterbalance that but that's only going to help us for a little while and i think that decision will come back to us thank you Teresa. thanks <clears throat> so um I would like to talk about um, what, I, what I mentioned in my introduction, which is um, my emphasis on open communication and transparency in the budget. Um, I would like to see more transparency in the budget. I think it's needed. Um, for instance, I've had a hard time um, finding things that I need on the website in general, the PSD um, website, and um, I've been having a hard time understanding the budget as far as there's a lot of details, very high terminology that I'd like to see more accessible. <clears throat> um, I've compared our budget online to the Douglas County budget um, online and their website is actually quite a bit more um, accessible than ours. <clears throat> it, they have an alphabet alphabetized um, search at the bottom. If you click on B, it will take you to all the Bs. You can click on B, budget, and there you go. There's one page, um, uh, a one page um, overview of 2010, 2011, and it's color coded. It is very accessible language, um, and uh, all of the the stats are there. Now, of course, um, Douglas County does have uh, in-depth overview um, 
many, many pages of their budget, and I appreciate both. And I'd, to, I'd like to see um, uh, the PSD uh, online budget do the same thing. And that's basically because I want all of the community members to, to understand what the budget's about. Um, thank you. Let me remind the candidates that it's valuable if you try to respond to the question rather than make another statement. And I realize this was a complicated question, but let's, let's do the best we can to address the question. And in this case, we're talking about balancing the budget and what the best, best approach is to doing that. Susan? You know, they say that if you stick around long enough, you see things come round and round again. And um, after 34 years in education, I, I got to say that this has come up, this question has come up several times. I can quote you a specific time when I was teaching in, uh, in Hooter School District, and the question came up, and the solution was to outsource a number of, um, of the services that are normally provided by PSD employees, because that way you don't have to pay them, um, you don't have to pay the, the um, um, para, you don't have to pay a number of, of things that employees uh, earn. Employees are expensive when you keep them in the, in the district. What they did was they outsourced, and I can give you a couple of, of examples very quickly. One of them was the custodial staff, and it worked for a while, but then they found that there was not that tie-in of team, that buy-in of I'm part of your school. I'll tell you what, if you have a good custodian who feels embraced by the school, the custodian will do wondrous things for your building. Second thing is the uh, uh, transportation. And I can't tell you how valuable it is to have a bus driver who greets your children in the morning as they get on the bus and who says goodbye to them when they leave. And that bus driver is an employee of Poudre School District, feels a sense of team, feels a sense of connection with our children. And I would, I would strongly advise that we consider having done that, and should we really do that again? Kathy. Well, I would have to agree with um, Tom and Nancy that those numbers that were read off were not numbers that um, I have heard before. I, I would like to see where they actually come from. Let's talk a little bit about um, the budgeting in our state, though. Um, we do have we, we are at about 40th out of the 50 states in funding education, okay? So if you look at the 50 states, if you account for cost of living in our area, we're about 40. If you look at absolute dollars, we're at about 46, 47 out of the 50 states in where we fund education. Our school district is at the bottom of all of the school districts in our state. So we're kind of at the bottom of the bottom of funding education. So while you might think that there is a massive amount of overhead, and I know I've heard some people say, oh, you know, the principals are paid too much, the superintendents are paid too much, no matter what your opinion is, those are specifics to be looked at, certainly. However, there are certain efficiencies that you have by having a central administration in a school district. And some of those efficiencies involve being able to support the teachers at the local schools. So I think if you have, for instance, um, a curriculum department that is out going out and supporting teachers in various ways so that they can provide curriculum and not having to reinvent the wheel every single time, that's an efficiency that comes out of your central administration. So you might not see it specifically in the classroom. It might look like an administrative cost. However, it is going to support the kids in the classroom. So I think you have to be very careful where you use that terminology. Thank you. Barbara. Those numbers are certainly not correct. Um, our stu per student funding from the state is around 7,600. It changes every year, but 18,000 would be wonderful, but we don't get funded at that level. Um, we do have an audit committee that is made up of members of the community and, of course, some of Dave Montoya and some other staff members, and their sole purpose is to uh, keep a close look on the budgets and what's going on and report back to the board. I served on that committee for two years, and it's an in-depth understanding of where our money is going. We do run and efficient district. I don't believe we have an overhead, exorbitant overhead problem. Um, we are presently working with the city and the county to try to uh, discover efficiencies that we might be able 
to establish among the three entities. We're all, you know, funded by the taxpayers, and we're looking at what are some mechanisms that we could all uh, come together on and share all of the community money. Um, we're always implementing efficiencies. The transportation schedule changed a year or two ago, and we adjusted start times so that the buses, for the most part, could all make two runs every you know, morning instead of one. And I believe I'm correct in saying our buses travel about 11,000 miles per day. So that's big money when you can adjust um, those type of things. And I know we buy fuel bulk, and we have energy efficiency savings in our buildings. So thank you. The next question asked, is closure of a school a valid option for dealing with schools that are severely under capacity? And I would ask you to explain, if so, why? And if not, what is the best approach? Nancy? Well, this is a, a question that all of us that have been on the board know a great deal about because we went through the process of considering that. I would say that closure of a school is, of course, an option. That's why we were discussing it and, and examining it. Uh, however, when one makes a decision about whether a school should be closed, uh, one has to first talk to the people, the parents, the staff, and, and students who are involved with that school, as well as the community members that live in that neighborhood, uh, and, and ask the, the questions so that you find out what are the values, what are the things that are going well, what are the, the needs or, or problems. Uh, a person also has to do research and look at the, at the data uh, in order to help make that kind of decision. And uh, I don't know, when we were considering school closure, I also talked to a couple of realtors and asked them to give me data about home sales in the neighborhood. So you have to do a thorough examination. What, uh, we, what I realized in, in doing that was that, number one, the parents were very happy with the level of services. Secondly, the school was using some real creativity in providing learning opportunities for kids with their current budget. Uh, thirdly, the students were achieving at a very high level. I don't consider it responsible use of resources to deprive students who are achieving uh, at a high level and having a very good experience. Stephen. Thank you. If I were, uh, if I had been on the board at the time the Beatty closure came to the board, I would have voted to close it because I think those budgetary decisions are very important and should not be taken lightly. On the other hand, I do know that there are many community members that are not happy with the decision-making process at the board. Those parents at Lopez have gone through two rounds of this in the possible closure of their school. And the parents around Zach Elementary and the uh, decisions for the attendance boundary uh, said to me point blank that they prepared a packet of information on the issues surrounding their uh, boundary issues and there were certain board members that did not pay attention to that whatsoever. So I, I know that uh, there are community members that feel that um, they're not being listened to. So uh, again, uh, school closure is a valid way of saving money. If uh, I value uh, community schools, neighborhood schools, if we really valued that, we would have not built Fossil Ridge High School so that the ninth graders could have stayed in the middle schools and sixth graders could have stayed in the elementary schools. That would have been the appropriate decision, but we did not have the proper leadership at the time to make those decisions. Thank you. Teresa. Um, so <clears throat> um, I've also done some of my research and I asked uh, several of the board members about um, uh, what they were thinking about uh, I, almost a year ago closing a school and a lot of factors and facts went into um, you know thinking about school closing schools um, <clears throat> as far as closing schools I don't think anybody really wants to I think a, a, a school building represents um, the hope for the, for the future a school building um, my thing that I really want to think about is are the students 
getting the resources that they need. Um, for instance, if there's, a, so our budgeting mechanism is such that it is student based and not program based. So if a school building has a low population of students at it, um, then a lot of the, the um, resources, the money goes to the overhead, um, running the school, administration, um, um, custodial concerns. And what I'd really, so not a lot of money or not enough money goes into um, or gets to the students. And what I'd like to see is maybe consolidating, if it, if it has to come to this, consolidating where two schools can meet in one school building and share resources that way. Um, and that will bring <clears throat> um, programs, because there's a higher population of, of children in the school building, more programs to them. For instance, Odyssey of the Mind and, and other programs. Um, and so education is more important um, than, than anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? Um, we actually lived through this because we lived there. What's that on? Is it on now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, we actually lived through this because we live a block away from Riffenburg. Our kids went to Riffenburg. Our grandkids went to Riffenburg. And um, it's such an integral part of our, of our community that when it was threatened and we were told that, that the school was going to be closed, we had very negative experiences with it. So I can say, as a parent, as a grandparent, um, as a community member, um, I had all of those feelings. Um, I think that that's part of it, the emotional part of it. People are tied to their, to their community and their school. The other thing to consider, though, is there are some schools that have been threatened with closure that are used in a variety of ways. Um, afternoon, evening, community purposes, taking care of families, a place to meet. Um, it's a multi-purpose building to begin with. Um, the other option, though, is what Riffenberg decided to do. So I can cite that as a specific example, and that is let's be proactive and find out how we can utilize this underutilized building and put um, another school in it. And as Teresa mentioned, the school within a school, we have our thriving Riffenberg population. In addition to that, we have early childhood. And the wonderful interaction that happens between Riffenburg as a school and the early childhood and the cross-age tutoring and things of that sort, those resources you cannot even be measured. And we have a very happy community. We still have our community school. So um, we made it work. And um, I believe that there are alternatives to closure. Thank you. Kathy? I think that there are a variety of factors that play into every single decision when you're looking at closing a school or not closing a school. I know that since I've been involved in the school district, they, we have gone through, I think, three specific, three individual um, instances of attempting to possibly close a school. And every time everybody gets so mad, we never close a school. And a lot of time and energy and effort is spent and wasted. So what I would really like to see us do is learn from those experiences on how to better approach this and go through a different process. Part of um, the reason I decided to run for school board is because I really feel like I'm very good at listening to people, at going out into the community and soliciting opinions and doing outreach. And I think that there are a lot of ideas out in our community where we can go and we can talk to people and we can say, look, here is the problem. Tell us what you think and let's not be boxed in by preconceived ideas. I know um, I was involved on the feasibility committee a couple of years ago where we were looking at possibly um, closing Red Feather, moving, you know, possibly closing Lopez, whatever. When you go into something with a preconceived idea, and have to look in a box to, for that solution, you are not going to be as successful when you, as you can be if you are allowed and permitted to look outside of that box for solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara? Regarding the school usage, uh, the board directed the administration to study the school's efficiencies and usage. And a large committee was convened of staff people, community members, all the stakeholders. And I know they met countless hours over 
weeks and brought forth recommendations. I believe there might have been as many as eight sites that were identified as underutilized. And then they started meeting with the sites and looking deeper into the situation. And unique circumstances were considered and we decided, like the mountain schools, it was not uh, feasible to, to close them. And it came down to Beatty, the recommendation was to close Beatty and consolidate it with Johnson and Lopez. All of the students except 40 would have gone to, from Beatty to Lopez, the other 40 would have gone to Johnson. At Lopez, with that extra funding, they would have been able to hire six literacy professionals and one counselor. At Johnson, they would have hired two additional literacy, literacy professionals. That's affecting a child's education. They would have had more educational support and learning with the staff. It's Nobody ever wants to close their school. That was one of the hardest decisions I had to make. But educationally, that would have been best for the children. It's also, uh, we have a responsibility to our taxpayers, and we need to look at the empty seats and how best to use our funding. Thank you. Tom. I voted not to close Beatty Elementary School, um, but to the getting to the question, is closure of a school an option for achieving greater efficiency? Absolutely. Um, as is underperformance, not serving the needs of children. And um, interestingly, in the Beatty situation, is um, we did not have one parent come to us and said, close our school, um, um, our kids are not being well served, we're under resources to the point where um, consolidation um, would make sense to us and and I think it must be said that in all our deliberations um, which were um, heated and honest and full of emotion because they were about things that people valued is that there were few if any um, people from the community who came and spoke to us publicly um, my stance on this issue is not ideological but based on individual circumstances in question for me, the value of community outweighed the projective savings, particularly in light of the innovation plan that was presented and is currently in progress. Um, in this particular instance, the decision was about two legitimate competing values, and that was uh, greater efficiency by using resources more effectively um, versus the needs of a community school. I did not think that the savings in the proportion in this equation um, were strong enough uh, to warrant closing a school at this time. Um, and particularly with the responsibility now uh, to the school and others who are doing innovation plans is they had give us a chance um, um, and uh, certainly that is in progress now. And we'll see how it works out. Thank you. At this time, we're going to take a brief intermission. Welcome to the second half of the League of Women Voters Board of Education Candidates Forum. I'm Katie Conan, a member of the League and a moderator for this part of the forum. We'll continue with our questions, and we're going to start with, um, Stephen, you go first this time. The question is, where is the district in ensuring that all classrooms are neither too hot nor too cold? What needs to be done? <laughs> well, I don't know. I think I'm kind of cold on that question. Um, <laughs> So uh, having a proper environment for the kids to learn is important. So although we may laugh a little bit, it actually is an important question. And it could cost money to deal with that properly. Um, so I would be very much uh, amenable to looking at uh, possibly changing the school year around a little bit. If we could start a little bit later to avoid some of the hot days uh, at the beginning of the school year and uh, have it instead go into June a little further uh, when hopefully the weather would be a little cooler. Uh, I think that would be uh, a wise choice to look at that first before expenditure of uh, equipment to handle that issue. Thank you. Thanks. Teresa? Um, so I've actually been thinking about this quite a bit. I have a couple of um, friends who are mothers, uh, and they take their children to Riffenburg, and apparently there was some kind of teachers or teacher-parent conference at the beginning of the year, and, and the parents were saying it was so hot, 
and it was at night, and they were wondering what their children were going to be doing. Um, so it's on my concern, they brought it to my attention. Um, I also went to the Board of Education meeting a month ago where this was discussed um, in depth about what should be done, and um, they still are thinking about it. Is that correct? What, what can be done um, to make the schools cooler when it's really hot? I've also thought about, you know, should we change the calendar year? And um, apparently there's a calendar committee, um, which I was excited about uh, for PSD. And if you go online, you, you can see why they choose the calendar um, uh, that they do. Um, a lot of people have expressed that they don't want to get out in the middle of June. Um, I think there's four pages of reasons why the calendar is the way it is. Um, apparently, I, I believe the reason why some of the schools are really hot is because the infrastructure uh, is very of the metal <clears throat> in the schools um, is heats up, gets really hot, and heats up the whole school. So, the infrastructure is one of those integral things that a, a school building need, or yeah, the building needs. So, gosh, I, I would like to know myself how to solve this problem. And anybody who wants to come up to me as a community member. Please let me know your ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Susan? When I heard this question, I was amused. Um, when I was uh, in teaching in the classrooms, I was at three different um, uh, middle schools, uh, Lesher, fine, you know, my final school, Bolts, and uh, Weber. Weber was a brand new school, so we didn't suffer too much. But at the other two schools, I could never figure out why it was that in the wintertime, the, um, the cooler came on and in the summertime the heat came on so I think maybe we could address that but I would um, I would say that having grown up in California and gone to California schools um, it's hot there too but we did start later and we started after Labor Day and uh, September still kind of hot but certainly not mid-August where it's blazing. And when kids are in hot climates or in their hot uh, rooms, I mean, you consider that you have the room and it's hot anyway, and then you put 35 bodies in there plus a teacher, oh my gosh, you know, it is sweltering. No learning goes on, it's very sad. Um, stopping in um, June, you know, I mean, June is June. I, I personally would have to admit I don't understand why we have to stop at, right at the end of May. Uh, go into June, make it more comfortable. It is an alternative to try and um, um, put um, mechanical um, things in there to, to help us. It's simply a matter of starting later. My understanding is that we are also pretty much attached, joined at the hip to um, Colorado State University's um, schedule, and so I know that that would take a bit of cajoling and um, a bit of collaboration to make that work, but I do know from years of experience that it seems like we walk lockstep with CSU. So we need to address the issue, and I think that we can, um, I think that we can work in a, in a cooler environment. Thanks, Susan. Kathy? Okay, those of you out there who know me know this is my issue, and it's like one of, well, one of my issues, because I've been on the calendar committee for a wide number of years, so I'm really not going to have time to address all of this, so if you have more questions, call me, email me, talk to me after, but, okay, there's a whole lot of factors that go into the calendar, and we actually have um, a lot of, we did an open response um, survey on the calendar committee last year. We did a survey, we got like 8,000 responses, believe it, we read through them all, we analyzed them. There are actually uh, many people in our community who want to stay, as they say, in lockstep with CSU. You also have um, a cooler September this year than we did last year. Last year, it was hot all the way through the end of September. So you cannot rely just on switching the calendar around to, to address the problem. Some of the things that we've talked about, um, and, and just one more thing, nobody in this district seems willing to own the problem, okay? <laughs> you talk about it in the calendar committee and they say, well, you know what, this really isn't our our area to address in a particular way. And I know I've only got 30 seconds. Like I said, this is way too much. Two things. One thing we could do is reverse the secondary and primary school start times, okay? Um, if you do that, you have the, the air-conditioned kids going later in the day when their actually brains are more active anyway, and the primary kids going earlier in the day when the schools are cooler. Second, we probably really need to look at getting green energy cooling solutions into the building, such as geothermal energy, et cetera. There's a lot of ways that we can do this, and um, I'm out of time, but call me. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Barbara? Thank you. Um, this is a difficult issue. It comes up every year. 
there was a survey conducted. There's been a lot of surveys conducted through the years. Um, some of the suggestions are, and the reason we start when we start is so high school can finish their final exams prior to the Christmas break. So one of the solutions offered has been have the elementary kids start two weeks later. Keep all the vacations the same, but alter those start times. And I think on the survey that might have received around 25% support. Um, another one to start earlier. Uh, Director Hayes suggested 6 a.m. or something like that, early release. There haven't been any suggestions that on the survey have had enough support to go ahead and move forward. It would cost 40 to $50 million to go back and retrofit our buildings. And two of our high schools are not air conditioned. Poudre High School is not, and most of Rocky is not. So it's a fallacy to believe that all the high schools are air conditioned. That's incorrect. Um, this is a difficult issue. There isn't an easy solution. Um, you know, we try to honor this community input, and all of the surveys that I am aware of have come back, leave it like it is. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Open for ideas. Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> Tom? A couple things on this, and uh, to get specifically to two parts of the question, one about the heat and then about what we can do related to the calendar, is um, we were given a thorough presentation by staff um, regarding the situation in heat and um, sometimes people uh, email with a, you a lot of solutions and don't realize that those probably have been looked at uh, many times and mm -hmm. um, oftentimes when we get back to people that indeed the district does look diligently at issues and um, investigates them thoroughly then um, uh, certainly you know their uh, their concerns and anger is mitigated when confronted with reality um, Barbara is exactly correct. The estimates we got is it's $45 million to air condition all of our buildings. Um, simply unaffordable um, at this particular time. Um, my experience teaching at Rocky Mountain High School um, in August, uh, a number of years ago, is we recorded temperatures over 97 degrees in one part of the building. Um, and another part of the building was air conditioned that was 75 degrees. And so there's a great inequity in, in terms of our, our facilities. Uh, there is a calendar process which provides opportunities for public uh, input. Um, the district has accumulated data on the issue. There's been suggestions for mitigating the heat that have been given to um, every school, principals, and staff. The most important thing is that teachers do their best to make kids comfortable and uh, to teach them uh, regardless of the circumstances that they find themselves in. Finally, the issue is not particular to PSD. Thank you. And Teresa? Um, oh, I'm sorry, Nancy. Yeah. I apologize. This, uh, this is, as, as other folks have said, a, a difficult problem. Uh, it's one that comes up, it lasts for a very short period of time, and then it's over. And yet we have, we have devoted a fair amount of time in the district over the years to trying to find better ways to handle this. Certainly there are some things that can be done in classrooms to help keep kids cooler. And there were some pretty uh, inventive ideas tried this year. I'm sure that some of those practices that seem more effective can be shared uh, with other schools. I think uh, and when the calendar committee comes back to report back to us, we will hear some of the discussions that they have been having. And uh, maybe this is something that we need to do a survey again, because people experiencing the heat once might say, oh, well, it was, it was kind of bad, but leave it as it is. People who have experienced it for a couple of years might be more interested in finding a solution. But there's, there is no easy answer to this. And $45 million uh, is way more than I think we want to spend on uh, a cooling system that is really only going to affect us for two weeks. So we are, we are certainly looking, though, for other solutions. This is not something we're just going to blow off and say, oh, too bad, uh, it's only a short time. We, we will be looking for answers. Thank you. And Stephen, you're last. I already addressed that question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm mixed up then. OK, then let's go on to the next question. Um, what do you see as the relationship between the district and the superintendent? And I'm going to put another little piece in this. Do you believe that the goals 
the Board of Education's goals for the superintendents and its evaluation of those goals be made public. Thanks, Teresa. So that's a two and three part question, so hopefully I can get all of that in, I'm sorry. So number one is, what do I think the, the relationship between the Board of Education and the superintendent is? Um, <clears throat> what I believe is that the Board of Education um, is ultimately responsible for everything that happens in the district. Um, the most important thing that the Board of Education does is to hire and then set goals um, for the superintendent. Um, as I've said before, I. Okay, what was the second part? The second part was, do you believe that the goals should be made and the goals and the evaluation of those goals be made public? Absolutely. I believe in transparency. I believe in open communication. It's imp important that not only does the superintendent know the goals that are set for him, but also all of um, <clears throat> the community to know what the superintendent um, is supposed to be doing. Um, and then ha transparency all around. You know, everyone knows. I'm going to stop there. Thank, Thank you. you. Susan? <coughs> there we go. Um, there does seem to be a concern in the district about that. Uh, as I have um, visited with community members, I find that um, there seems to be a disconnect uh, uh, between the um, administration and the community, um, kind of with the board in between. Um, that worries me because I think that it's something that we definitely need to work on. Um, we do talk about collaboration, transparency, and all of those things. They are crucial to um, the community working well together with, uh, with the, the superintendent and the board. So the goals established, the superintendent as, our, uh, as the board's um, um, employee, I think it is vital that uh, the goals be made known to the community and that the evaluation of the superintendent be made public as well. Um, if we're going to move forward, if, if the community is going to feel as stakeholders uh, in a variety of different um, aspects of the, of the school district that they are being heard, that they're being listened to, that they're being valued, they need to be communicated with. And so I, I would say that we need to be as transparent as possible. Um, and I believe that we can repair the hurt feelings and the feeling of being disenfranchised that apparently uh, pervade our district at this point. Thank you. Kathy? Policy governance um, says that the relationship between the Board of Education and the superintendent is like the relationship of a board of directors to a CEO. That is um, what we what the Board of Education passed several years ago in um, turning on this thing called policy governance. Um, some people were not quite as happy with the decision when it passed because they felt that it removed the ultimate um, accountability of, of the board to the people that they represent. So no matter which side of that issue you're on, I do believe that yes, the goals and evaluation of the superintendent should be public, okay? If you, and especially in our um, environment that we currently have, there is a large amount of dissatisfaction, I think, with our current um, district leadership. I mean, if you look at, um, fr fr from all parts of the community, from parents, from community, from, from teachers, we have, um, we were criticized in the Katie Report, which was the comprehensive, comprehensive appraisal for district improvement on our climate and culture in our district as being more of a top-down district than a collaborative district. And we really need to make sure that we are listening to all voices. So when those evaluations come around, I think it's, not impor it's important not just for the board to to, to listen within itself and to make that public, but I think it's important to go and perform outreach with all parts of our community to get feedback on how they believe the, um, the superintendent's doing to make that evaluation and um, do it properly. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Would you just read the first part of the question again, please? Yes, the first part is, what do you see as the relationship between the district and the superintendent, or the board and the, and the superintendent, and should the goals, and then the second part is, um, should the Board of Education's goals for the superintendent and its evaluation of those goals be public? Okay, thank you. Um, the board has one employee, and that is the superintendent of schools. And that is the only person we, we direct through our policies and what we have as set our expectations for performance of the 
superintendent and of the district. Um, the Katie report gave us a lot of valuable information, and as a result of that, Director Albright and I proposed a strate strategic vision for the board to work on to set goals and expectations for superintendent and district performance. There's a subcommittee working on that now. Um, part of that, the core part of that is to determine the core values of the community and use that to guide our decisions when we are uh, having to make difficult decisions around scarce resources. Um, it's also to clearly articulate the board's expectations of the district and the superintendent. And thirdly, to set the performance goals and the benchmarks. We accept the monitoring reports that are given to us from the superintendent, and those through policy governance are that person's evaluation. So by accepting those monitoring reports, we have accepted that the superintendent is doing an acceptable job. And again, part of the vision is to add in some of those um, areas from the Katie report that we found out were, we hadn't been measuring. So we are um, working within our structure of policy governance, and we can always fine tune that and uh, further drill down to the, the parts we need to get. And oh, I'll just be real quick. Should that ma be made public? The monitoring reports are all on the website. Um, and then, of course, you have some confidentiality uh, issues surrounding any personnel decisions. So thank you. Tom? In answer to the first inquiry regarding the relationship between the board and the superintendent is a lot of that is determined by state statute. And um, there are certainly lists of responsibilities that are absolutely required by law, mm -hmm. and there are certain lists of responsibilities in terms of um, what boards can do that are optional. And I think it's the prerogative of each individual, individual district and the currently elected board to determine um, in what direction that goes. Um, should uh, goals and evaluation be made public? Um, should the evaluation of every teacher be made public? Um, I, um, the board is authorized on behalf of the community to evaluate the superintendent. I respect current practices related to employee evaluation. Um, I do believe that the criteria for evaluation should be made public. And as uh, Barbara has indicated is under policy governance, certainly um, a critical look at uh, monitoring ports related to board policy is an evaluation that takes place at almost every uh, board meeting. Um, and then when you get into the differentiation of um, responsibilities, you're talking about the difference between means, which are the operations, achieving ends, which are uh, directed by policy. And then you have to ask yourself in, in terms of evaluation is what is the purpose of the evaluation? And if the purpose of the evaluation is to improve, and if you want people to be honest and to have those people who are empowered to make that decision, um, again, I, um, I would not favor making that totally public at this time. Thank you. Nancy? Uh, well, my uh, other folks that are sitting up here with me have uh, answered this question fairly thoroughly, but I will say that uh, the relationship between the board and the superintendent is something that we have defined in our policies, we meaning the school board. So we have identified what that relationship is. and. Therefore, uh, that's how it should be evaluated, and it is evaluated because, uh, as has been mentioned, we have monitoring reports. They are detailed and specific, and we spend a good deal of time in our board meetings discussing the monitoring of uh, our policies. So when we are doing that, we are also discussing the superintendent's performance while we're discussing the district's performance in regard to those policies. Mm -hmm. I also agree that uh, when it comes to certain uh, kinds of discussion that are um, that are personal behavior uh, kinds of things, there has to be a place to draw a line there where uh, that becomes then a, a personal conversation between an employer and an employee, just as that happens, I think, any place else. But uh, if folks would like to know about um, about our district goal learning goals, we are having in-depth discussions of those uh, in our board meetings right now, and 
I uh, invite you to listen in and, and hear uh, that public discussion. Thanks. Stephen? Thank you. So the question was kind of loaded because it made it sound like, what are the goals for the superintendent personally? And personnel evaluations are done in executive session as with any other board or city council. Those are not public. Uh, but goals for the district, for the ends policy that the board uh, creates and monitors, those are public. And that is really the way that the public is going to evaluate not just the performance of the superintendent, but the performance of the board. Mm -hmm. And because the board is really the only way that parents and taxpayers can hold the board and the superintendent accountable. Mm -hmm. So your vote out there for uh, the varying candidates is the accountability that you have to employ for this. So the goals for the for the superintendent, the goals for the district and the and the uh, educational growth of our students, are absolutely public and need to be discussed in, on a regular basis with with the parents and and the community. That's the way uh, policy governance uh, should work, and the way the relationship with the board with the community should work. So. Um, Let's, let's keep things in the, in the public realm that uh, deserve to be there and uh, have those proper discussions with the community. Thanks. Okay, the next question will start with you, Susan. The question is, what is your position on the state board rules requiring parental notification of school employee arrests? The, my personal use of Sam. Yeah, it's um, what, your position. On it. Um, there's, um, I, you know, I support, I, I, I don't know how else to say other than um, that I support parental notification if there's, um, if there's been an arrest, uh, especially, oh, sorry. And I'm not sure whether we're talking about specifics, but there were um, issues this past year and, and uh, so forth with regard to um, incidents that had taken place um, between adults and um, uh, uh, in a position of authority and children. Arrests were made, and the decision um, was made not to make those public. It became an issue, and the issue was resolved by agreeing that in the future, such incidents, when it involved arrests, would be made um, would be made public would be made um, uh, known to the parents, and um, I support that wholeheartedly. Thank you, Kathy. People who work with children are in a special position of trust in our community, and so I believe that in order to maintain that trust, we need to make sure that we do as much as we can to make sure that parents are informed when things happen that could have affected their children or could possibly affect their children in a school building. So I think that we need to make sure that as much as is possible that we are inform parents of what's going on. Thank you. I support the state board rules regarding parental notification. Um, which require that when an employee is arrested or charged with uh, something that would affect the student, say for perhaps a, a bus driver has a DUI, that then the parents are notified. Um, the situation a year or so ago that occurred, um, the district was criticized for not being forthcoming. We always take something like that very seriously. We convened a committee of Larry Abrahamson, uh, Kelly DiMartino from the city, uh, similar position from CSU and the Poudre Valley Hospital. So legal and communication experts to review our policy and give us input on what we could do better. And that's what they did. And we adopted that uh, important feedback to guide our work. Um, so I think, you know, we had, had a weak spot and we corrected it and that then went forward to the state level and I do agree with uh, the state rules that the board has agreed upon. So thank you. Tom? Uh, the state board is currently being sued over this new direction that many believe goes too far. Um, while good intentioned, 
Um, when you look at the, the language in the bill, it does uh, provide um, the unintended consequences of uh, people being uh, branded for misconduct um, without fair due process. Um, this is a complicated issue. Of course we're interested in protecting uh, student safety. And um, this, uh, the State Board action was a direct result of um, perceptions of, of things that happened in the Poudre School District. And again, I concur with uh, Barbara that what we did is we looked at best practices related to how to address this issue, is we invited in um, objective observers, including, including Larry Abramson, people from the police department, people from the Colorado Association of School Boards, and we were found to be in compliance um, with what needed to take place. We did make some modest adjustments to it, um, but I. I, I think the intention of protecting children is uh, paramount, um, but we need to be careful of uh, directives uh, related to law uh, that violate the rights of employees um, um, who may be innocent and, um, and, so, and has unintended consequences. So I think um, it's good that this issue is being discussed and we'll see what the result is on the state level. Thank you, Tom. Nancy? Uh, once again, <laughs> uh, I think Barbara and Tom have, have explained very clearly what took place and, and what the particular issues are, so I'm not going to revisit that. I will just say that as a district and a board, we are very interested in being public about what we do and in notifying parents uh, whenever we feel that there is something they need to know about. We also, though, know it's important to protect the innocent. So uh, this, this issue is now working its way through the courts, and, and it will be resolved. And at this time, we are uh, adhering to uh, the requirements of this law. Thank you. Stephen? Thank you. Uh, I think parental notification is very important, and I absolutely support the efforts of the State Board of Education to improve parental notification requirements even though they, the uh, state teachers union is not supportive of that. And I think that's why it's very important that we have on this board representation of parents and taxpayers in these kinds of issues, not just representation of the teachers. The issue of parental notification for um, problems with teachers is one issue, but another issue is also what happens when a student is getting into trouble at the school. I think uh, recent events in our city have shown that I think it's very important that a parent be notified when a student gets in trouble before we have a, a police officer questioning a student about activities that could um, blow completely out of proportion. So it's not just teachers that are involved in, in issues, it's also uh, students. Um, and I think parental notification for those kinds of issues is, is very important as well. Thank you, Stephen. Teresa? Um, so I support parental notification. <clears throat> um, actually, this is thing, something that I thought about quite a bit. Um, on the one hand, you have, what, for, if I remember my 18th century American history, um, what defines Americans, uh, the, how great America is compared to England is um, innocent until proven guilty. On the other hand, you're looking at children and their well-being. Um, so that's why I support in the end. Um, as I talked about this with my husband, and, <clears throat> and my child is currently not with me, and she's in an orphanage, and I don't really know, <sighs> sorry, I don't really know if she's being abused or not, and I would want to know. I know arrest does not mean conviction, but if it's 50-50, I'm going to say I'd want to know at that time, within 24 hours. Um, if the teacher is proven to be innocent, um, within two weeks, the, parent, uh, the parents of that school are notified um, about the innocence. Um, I'd like to see if the teacher is proven innocent, uh, maybe another step further. I'm not sure exactly what that would be. I'm still thinking about it. Thank you. Okay. Our next question, Kathy, you're going to answer first this time. The question is, what is the most important issue the district should focus on? 
We have a lot of very important issues that our district faces. We have perpetual budget problems when it comes to education. We have perpetual standards problems. For instance, we have um, a whole new, um, I'm sorry, I'm sort of losing it at the end of the day here. We have um, a whole new curriculum, um, not curriculum, but standards that we will be um, implementing. We have an achievement gap between our poor and minority students and our other students in the district. We have a whole range of problems that we really need to address, but I believe that the overarching, overriding thing that is going to help us get to the solutions to these problems is going to be addressing the climate and culture in our district and the communication. I really believe that we need to start earlier in every single process and bring in parents and community and all of the voices in the district in order to generate ideas and order to be part of the process and be part of the solution to all of these problems. Um, I've been involved in this district for many years now, for eight years, since my kids were in kindergarten, and I truly believe that there are many people who wish to get involved and propose solutions, and we have been, um, in many cases, a very difficult district to communicate with and to work with, and I think that being a more collaborative district instead of a top-down district will help provide the answers to our problems. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Barbara? Well, the most important issue is always education. That's, what, that's why we exist, to prepare our children to be successful adults and successful citizens. That's where we have to spend our resources and our focus and our emphasis. Especially now, things have really changed. Our kids will be working in jobs that don't even exist yet. They will be using technology that doesn't exist yet. They will be collaborating with people halfway around the world that speak different languages. That's where we need to be focusing. The end result of this district is preparing our kids. Um, I do want to thank the people who uh, support the voters supporting us again for the mill bond. The mill uh, supported the technology initiative, and you probably saw in the paper a couple of weeks ago at Poudre High School, all the freshman students were issued laptops. That is really significant because a lot of our kids don't have technology at home, and the only place they learn how to use it is at school, and that's the tools of the future. That's part of preparing those kids for the future. They have to think critically, be adaptable. Um, I believe the statistic is something they're going to have seven or eight jobs by the time they're 36, 38 years old. And not just jobs, but perhaps different careers. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it was uh, a couple of generations ago where you did the same thing and maybe had one or two employers your entire life. So it's always about the kids. It's always students first and preparing them. Thank you. Tom? Uh, I'm in synchrony with uh, Barbara on this one, is that our ongoing most important issue is how to achieve our mission of educating every child every day in a way that meets the individual needs of children through a balanced curriculum. Um, in a collaborative culture, um, that values um, the people who are delivering the services and the folks who support them um, through the values that have been related to us by our, our community and, um, and by the trust that has been given us to uh, do this important work. Thank you, Tom. Nancy? Um, coming off such a beautifully stated poll, <laughs> I would just like to say that uh, I absolutely agree that um, the most important issue for this district every day is how can we better educate our students. Um, we, we are a very effective district and we have had some incredible successes, but we aren't finished yet. We continue to have to look at how can we do better. And that is something that, that goes on here all the time uh, and must. Uh, we are, as, as was mentioned, we are upgrading the, the technology, not only the laptops that kids uh, take home with them, but also the technology that exists in classrooms for the use of teachers. We also are providing support and training for those teachers, and we need to continue to do that in an effective way so that they feel comfortable and, and are effective with the tools that, that we're providing. 
Uh, we also are working to constantly working to provide a rich, broad-based curriculum uh, for our kids so that they're not focused narrowly on just on technology. They're using technology in a broad way to emerge with uh, a, a broad education. So uh, those are things that, that we are talking about all the time in order to better educate our kids. Thank you, Nancy. Steven? Thank you. Um, I think Barbara provides terrific leadership for the board in educating our children, uh, every child, every day. Uh, and she uh, talked about those issues very well. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that uh, there is an issue that's going to come before the board in the next couple of years that's going to be very contentious, and that is the change in the teacher evaluations. You can't have a good education without good teachers. And how we evaluate our teachers is going to change because of SB 191, and that will be contentious. And I think that, um, you know, I, I'm getting evaluated twice this year. Current uh, agreement with the teachers union says that teachers only get evaluated once every three years. This is going to change. It will cost some money for the district to do that. But I welcome those changes, and I welcome being the the chance or, or, or being that person to be the voice for parents and taxpayers in the change of those evaluations so that teachers get evaluated in a more real life business manner um, so that student growth, academic growth can be part of that evaluation and the other parts of the evaluation will have to be yet decided how we mix the 360 evaluations from other teachers and, and administration. And uh, there's going to have to be a lot of discussion on that, and I look forward to being part of that. Okay. Teresa? Um, <clears throat> I think, well, I have two parts to this. The first part is um, open communication. Um, I think the best part of policy governance is the com community involvement, um, talking to the Board of Education about what is going on. Um, one thing that I really want to do is um, meet w as a board member, um, is to meet with um, various members of the community and in groups uh, throughout the, the school district, um, throughout the school year, uh, on a regular basis. I think that's very important um, <clears throat> just to, to get a feel of what people are thinking. Um, my second thing is um, education. Education for the children is most important. To not only look at the low performing students um, that are in the achievement gap, uh, that are having problems, but also to look at the high achieving students that need more support, um, those gifted and talented. Um, as I've heard that our gifted and talented program is in its infancy and it really needs some help to, um, to be supported and I think that's one of the things that we could also dwell on. Um, to make sure that every child is um, um, uh, being supported in their specific um, abilities. That's important. Um, thank you. And Susan. I seem to be in reverse of my uh, opponent in how I look at, um, at our needs um, with regard to the achievement gap. Um, I would say that that is our primary um, need to look at right now. Having grown up as a very, very poor child, daughter of a, uh, of a single mom struggling so hard in Los Angeles to, um, to um, provide me with the opportunities to succeed. It's in my heart uh, to help the um, underserved, the underprivileged in our district, and we have a large percentage of those. We have kids who don't eat um, uh, sufficiently. We have um, children who uh, live out of cars. We have so many children who are disadvantaged. Um, and my heart goes out to them, um, and I think that, that it's, it would serve the board well, and I, as a, as a board member, would pledge my um, support and my advocacy for those children, um, uh, because I, I believe in all my heart that we need to educate all children, and I always say, I always emphasize all children with, um, you know, in the, in the most supportive and effective way possible. And I do know that we have the, uh, the student-based um, budgeting um, model, and I think we need to revisit that, and we need to think about reallocating some of our, our funds so that we can support those children because they need us desperately. I want to thank all of you for your, 
thoughtful questions that the audience provided tonight and also your thoughtful answers. Um, we're going to go to the conclusions now. We'll give you one minute, and I'm going to start in reverse order. I'm going to start with you first, Susan. Okay. Um, you know, I, I uh, uh, mentioned in my introduction that I, um, I want to give my time back to Poudre School District, to the community, for the good work that uh, the PSD has done for my kids and for, and for me. Um, uh, and I was a very, very happy employee at the time that I was with the district. Um, I see myself as a board member as a bridge uh, between the community and the schools. And um, just as I was in the classroom, I was a bridge between the parents and the, and the children. Um, it, it, it extends more. Um, and as I mentioned about my concern for the underprivileged, I, I also embrace the idea that we do need to follow the Katie report and, uh, and look closely at the task force that's working on open communication because I, I do feel that we need some work there. And um, uh, as a board member, I'll work very hard to try and, and open those lines of communication. I do still believe, as I've said before, that there are um, uh, there is a feeling of disconnect and a feeling um, of not being listened to, and I think we can go a long way to repairing that relationship, and we have to have that relationship with the community in order to have that sense of team. We have to have schools and families and community working together in order to further PSD as um, the excellent district that it has always been. Thank you, Susan. Teresa? Thank you. Um, so I mentioned in my introduction that I'm going to uh, finish my background um, in my conclusion. Um, again, my name is Teresa Affleck. Um, I've come from a family that, ha that highly values education. I've lived in Fort Collins for 10 years and been married to my husband, Steve, for nine. Um, we're, you know, I've said this before, in the process of adopting a little girl from Kyrgyzstan. She's three and a half years old. Um, I have a Bachelor's of Science in English and um, <clears throat> a minor in Psychology. Oh, it was almost a double major, um, and uh, that's where my communication focus comes in. I have a master's of English from CSU, um, and I've mentioned this before. I've been, I've been an educator for 17 years um, in different um, ways, but I've never been a PSD teacher. Um, for the past two years, I've taught at, um, at CSU, teaching a research via technology class. Um, I've been a substitute teacher uh, in PSD for five years. And I volunteered um, within the district uh, for nine years, um, <clears throat> off and on. And I'm currently a, a volunteer. Um, I also tutor a PhD student. Um, I bring a fresh perspective. I have no affiliations. And I believe in um, open communication and transparency in the budget and high standards. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephen? Thank you. I look forward to being the voice of parents and taxpayers on the board for issues that are important to, to everyone and balancing the issues of teachers and parents and students and taxpayers. Um, it's important to, to know that uh, my experience on the electric board and the Larimer County Board of Health has prepared me to work collaboratively with other people on a board and because I think that is important and, and to be effective, not just to work together, but to be effective. I'd like to point out that my opponent has twice voted to spend tens of thousands of district dollars on a lawsuit for the Lobato uh, lawsuit trying to overturn the uh, state of Colorado funding mechanism. I think our money should be spent in the district and in the classroom as much as possible. So I would not vote for spending money in that way because we need to be accountable for how the money is spent and it should be spent in the classroom as much as possible. Please uh, go to my website, steveurash.com, to get more information. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy? I'm asking for your vote because I've worked tirelessly toward an excellent education for our students in this district. I face every decision with my mind set, not on the answer, but on gathering all the relevant information, uh, gathering available input, and carefully analyzing to arrive at the right decision for our students. I know the importance of staff knowing support and having input. 
I've been part of extensive community input on uh, various issues in the district. Our di students are achieving at high levels and we've recently seen some significant improvements. I would like your support to continue the work that I have been doing and to improve on that and do better work uh, in the coming years. Thank you. Tom? Uh, thank you. Um, knowledge, commitment, and a passion for education are reasons I'm seeking re-election. Gratitude for a community which supports education and a concern for the educational opportunities of children throughout the state energizes me to continue this rewarding work. Initiatives related to health and wellness, strategic planning, and advocating for the arts and PE are a few of the, uh, of the items I look forward to addressing. Concerns over state policy and funding sometimes appear daunting, but I believe we can rise to the occasion with optimism and resolve when addressing these challenges. And finally, and finally just one last message. Um, I'm making a list and I'm checking it twice. <laughs> Please mail in your ballots before the fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Barbara? Very good, Tom. <laughs> How do I follow that? <laughs> uh, cookies and coffee afterwards. <laughs> Um, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, my experience on the board for the past four years and my in-depth experience, I've been involved on a lot of committees and a lot of different levels, has prepared me to be an effective member as we face the challenges of the future. There are the new legislative mandates, the budget challenges, and like I said, most importantly, preparing our kids f to be successful citizens in the new global marketplace. Um, I believe in standards-based education, educators who support student growth, advanced student growth, community partnerships, a parent's freedom to choose, and always putting students first. Um, I'm a parent, business owner, school and uh, community volunteer. My calm demeanor and my sound judgment has served me well. I think strategically and I act decisively and I am capable of making tough choices in very controversial issues. I ask for your support and uh, please visit my website. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Kathy. Hi, thank you again to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum tonight and thank you for all of you for coming out and taking the time to educate yourself about this election. School board elections are important and I hope everybody um, takes the time to evaluate the issues and the candidates and takes the time to vote. We do have um, many challenges in our district and as I would like to reiterate that I am the only current parent of PSD kids running, I think it's really an important voice to bring to our district level. Um, we need to make sure that we're listening. We need to reach out to parents and community. We need to reach out to staff. We need to be open and transparent. And ultimately, we need to do what's best for all of our kids. Please take the time to vote, and I ask that you vote for me. Thank you. Have a great night. Well, Kathy, you just stole my thunder. <laughs> um, we want to thank everybody for being here tonight. I want to remind you that the ballots are going to be due at 7 p.m. on Election Day, Tuesday, November 1st. If you need more information about drop-off hours or other election-related questions, please contact the City Elections Office at 221-6515, or you can log on to the website and they'll display a screen with information for you. Um, thanks to the audience for your thoughtful questions, as I said before, and for being here. And thanks to our candidates for all their time and energy that they've put into this. And if you'll join me with a round of applause.